you got so many praises about your piano this morning that I want to make sure that the very last note got played before I interrupt it. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Those of you who are joining us in person and those of you joining us online, we'd like to wish everybody a happy Sabbath this morning. Um, at this time, if you've got any prayer requests or praises, please be thinking about them because I will read them out here shortly. We've got, I believe, uh, 12 people joining us online. Ten have remained anonymous. Two are uh, admitting that they're online. Actually, three are admitting that they're online. So Paul Eskew, Nettie Lytle, and Rachel Black. Happy Sabbath. I thought I saw a gentleman by the name of Steve pop in, um, but I think my, my Facebook feed is hiding comments. So uh, if you wrote something and it got hidden and I, you don't hear me say it, just uh, just type it back in. I, I'm uh, apparently not, uh, not knowledgeable on how to use Facebook anymore. Ivy, happy belated birthday to Sharon Perlay. Per per Sharon P., happy Sabbath. <laughs> sorry, sorry, folks. I'm from Texas. I only got one accent. Um, so happy Sabbath on behalf of Ivy to Sharon. Sharon, um, happy belated birthday, I mean. Um, thank you for that, Ivy. Any other birthdays in person or online, let us know right now. We'd like to celebrate with you and wish you a happy birthday. Got a handful of announcements this morning. Jaime Jorge will be in concert Saturday, May 1st at Albuquerque Central SDA Church. Admission is free. That'll begin at 6.30 p.m. Um, there will be an offering uh, collected at the time, and there is limited seating available by reservation. So if you're interested in making a reservation, there's three ways you can do that. You can text 505-980-2563. Again, that's 505-980-2563. And request a reservation. You can email news at abqcentral.org. That's N-E-W-S at abqcentral.org. Or you can scan the QR code that's listed in uh, this morning's bulletin. If you are going to make a reservation, we ask that you provide the number of people that are joining your party by name, a phone number or email to contact you, and the number of reservations requested. Uh, the um, Central SDA Church is asking, though, for... If you are going to come, please um, bring a mask and uh, follow social distancing guidelines. Um, they will be contract tracing and will notify you within uh, well, in an adequate time should something come up. In the event of a positive COVID-19 test, within 10 days after the concert, they will notify the church representative who in turn will notify everyone who attended the concert. So uh, AB ABQ Central wants to be clear about that. And if you're going to attend, please honor the request. Children's church is back, and it's happening next door. Uh, I don't know what the count was last week, but I know the first week we had about 25 uh, kids over there next door. And um, when church was over, those church doors exploded with excitement and joy and noise. So um, it, it was awesome. It was awesome to see uh, our children back at it again. We know over the last year they've, they've taken a, a brunt of the impact of this whole COVID pandemic. So we're very grateful to the staff next door that is helping with that. Um, again, that children's church is designed for children between the ages of four and 12. Uh, we're asking that the kids not bring any toys or anything like that. Um, Kathy will be handing out new masks for them. And um, we ask that parents uh, stay back and, and not attend. So if you're interested with either teaching or assisting a children's church, please speak to Kathy Clifford and she would be um, more than happy to assist. Uh, we are also streaming that via Zoom for those of you who are at home and would like your child to join that. The Zoom ID is 875-7599-0717. So if you're joining us online right now and would like your child to join in on that, again, the Zoom ID is 875-799-0717. We're a little lean on our church donations for the month of March. We're, we're about $2,900 short, so um, I know we're not actively picking up offering, but I do want to remind everyone we've got a little black box behind Jennifer there in the back and right next to Al, where you can drop off your um, tithe and offering. Uh, also, you can go to adventistgiving.org, select the Corrales SDA Church, and enter the amount of your donation to the appropriate column. Uh, we're also continuing to fundraise for our church renovation project, so don't forget about that. I think demo is scheduled for sometime in June, um, but Willie will have more information on that. 
Let me see who else is joining us online. Steve Espy. Steve, I thought I'd seen you uh, joining us online, so happy Sabbath to you as well. Um, Jenny Larson is joining us as well. Jenny, we miss you. We miss seeing you greet, but happy Sabbath. Uh, Giselle O'Daniel, happy Sabbath. And Casey Harris, our principal over at Sandy View Christian School, is joining us online as well. Happy Sabbath to you all. Thank you for joining us online. We've got about 14 people joining online right now. So again, if you'd like for us to recognize you, just shoot me a happy Sabbath in our live stream, and I will read that, your name out to the congregation. This time, I would like to take any prayer requests or praise, if both online and in person. If anyone has anything, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll go up and grab that from you. Got Maritza who wrote them down. So Maritza says, Please pray for my grandkids, kids, and sisters. May God touch their hearts as He has touched my son's heart. Amen. Maritza, we will continue to pray for your grandkids, kids, and sisters. Um, I do know that we've had a lot of people here in the audience experience loss over the last year. Um, I think Maxine, uh, you're probably the latest person that I'm aware of that has lost a loved one. But Alan, Lydia, Carol Duttweiler, uh, those of you that have lost someone over the last year, we have not forgotten about you. Uh, you continue to be in our thoughts and our prayers. If there's anything that the church can do for you, please reach out to myself or Pastor Mike. Uh, and we're more than happy to assist in any way that we can. Uh, John Tarbox, we haven't forgotten about you. I know we sent you a book earlier this week. We hope you got it if you're joining us online. Um, if you're so compelled to, to read that book and reach out to us, man, we're here for you. So let us know. Rachel Black, praise God for his many blessings in my life in the life of my family. Amen to that. There's a lot of rays of sunshine amongst the clouds still, so we're grateful to the Lord for the blessings that he has for all of us, not, not just Rachel. Any other prayer requests, both in person and online? Uh, <laughs> Mercedes Jeans has three. Well, we've got time, so go for it, Mercedes. <laughs> Okay, and El yeah, Eliana, LASIK surgery on Friday, so we'll be praying for you. Absolutely. Yeah, I had it a few years ago. It's freaking when you're going, man, but it's completely as, as normal as they say it will be. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so co Alma, Alma, co-worker of Mercedes Jean, had gallbladder surgery, like an, emergency an emergency gallbladder surgery. Okay, and then they found an inflamed pancreas at the same time. Okay, another friend doing an exam for masters, so praying for that. Okay, for your daughter, for your co-worker, and for a friend, yeah. we will continue praying for that. Thank you, Mercedes, for bringing it to the table. Happy Sabbath to you all, by the way. Good to see you. Anybody else? Prayer request? Carol? Mary Ann Lira? Okay. Just a sign of request for her? Okay. Okay. Mary Ann Lira, we'll, we'll keep her in prayer on behalf of Carol Detweiler. Anyone else? So Leah wants to pray for her great-grandma, who is getting better, recovering. She's up and walking, but your mom still has to go out there about every other weekend to, to assist. So absolutely, we'll, we'll continue to pray for your great-grandma. Leeway, good to see you and your wife here. Happy Sabbath. Glad, glad to see you. I know you were in the hospital, I believe, a few weeks ago, so it's good to see you here in person. Um, any other prayer requests or praises? Mom's having surgery on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. 88 uh, year old mom having surgery on Tuesday, so we will continue to pray for her. Okay. Um, anyone else? Prayer requests or praises? Okay. Ms. Erica Fetke is getting closer and closer to labor. Um, 
So no, that's not selfish. We will absolutely be praying for you and the health of your baby. Um, we're excited to have another, another, another little member of our family. So Matthew and Erica and, and uh, Lily, we will be praying for the whole family as you guys continue to grow. Anybody else prayer requests or praises? All right, I've got Louie and then Al. Louie? All right, Lou, new job, and he's stoked about it. Good, 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 good. Praise God for that. Al? For my brother in law, Brendel, I just had an accident. Did you pray for him like I saw him yesterday? It looked like it um, got worse. So I'm not asking for a healing or something. Because he's struggling with things, and then my sister's having a hard time with it. Brother in law, Brendel, it's getting worse, and we're asking not for healing at this point, but for peace and for strength. And also for your sisters as they as they deal with it. Okay, another one with cancer. Okay, dang. All right, I'll we'll definitely be praying for you and your family. Let's see if I've got anything else online. Nothing else online. Anybody else? Any prayer requests or praises at this time? All right, going once, going twice. All righty, let's go ahead and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for bringing us here this morning uh, to come together as a church family, um, as, as some of us still strangers, but yet united, Father, and unified in, in your precious blood, God. There's a lot of suffering in this world right now, Lord. Um, there's a lot of death, Father. There's a lot of uh, evil running amok in our world, Father. Um, both at the cellular level and at the very real, visible level, and then obviously in the spiritual realm, God. But we know that your Holy Spirit is powerful. We know that you're omnipresent, Father. We know that you're all-consuming, God. And we know that you're more than willing to embody us, Father, with the Holy Spirit. To bring comfort, to bring peace, to bring healing. And sometimes just to bring silence, Father. As we sit still, maybe not understanding the wildness of this world, Father. But in, in the stillness, Father, acknowledging that you are God. So this morning, God... We just ask for the Holy Spirit to bring peace and comfort to your people, Lord. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be, bring peace and comfort to those suffering, God. Um, we thank you, God. We thank you so much, Father, for despite the storms of life that we face, God, there's still so much to be grateful for, Lord. We're sitting here together in a beautiful, temperature-controlled, um, welcoming and loving church, Father, ready to praise you, God. We're privileged to have Pastor Mike as our pastor and Marley as, uh, uh, Molly as our pianist, God. We're just so blessed and we're so lucky, Father. And we know those blessings come from you, Lord. So this morning, as we plead with you to send us the Holy Spirit, we also acknowledge, God, the rays of sunshine that you send our way. Father, we invite the Holy Spirit right now to be with Pastor Mike as he delivers this morning's message, Father. May it not be his tongue or his spirit or his mind or his agenda or his words to speak. Um, to us, Father, but may it be you, Father, it's just simply using Mike as a vessel, Father, that not only touch our hearts, but wrestle with our hearts, wrestle with a dirty part of sin that we love to hang on to, Lord. Help us to become a church, Father, that embodies your love, your grace, your mercy, and your spirit, and a church where people can come to weekly, Father, and feel uplifted, heard, and supported. We love you, God, so much, and we thank you so much for all the blessings and for who you are.
morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see everybody here, to be in the house of the Lord. While, um, you know, we were having the opening song, I was just watching Molly. Not in a creepy way, but, you know, I was just watching her. <laughs> and she was just jamming out on the piano. She wasn't even looking at the notes. I don't know if your eyes were open or closed, but she was just... Um, jamming out, and I think that's really cool. And and I think for us, church should be a time. Let me take this off. Church should be a time where, you know, we're not worried about what's going on around us, what's going on in the world, and it's just our time, right? You're just in the zone. You're zone with Jesus. Before we get into the word today, there's a few housekeeping um, things that we need to do. Very important um, things. Uh, today we're going to have a profession of faith. For those of you guys who are not familiar with how a profession of faith works, maybe you're new to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there are three ways that we do for you to join our church. One of them is through membership transfer. So let's say um, you're a member in Maryland or you're a member of the local ch Adventist Church in Santa Fe and you want Corrales to be your home church, then we would do what you call a membership transfer and we would, um, that would be Matthew's thing the church clerk. The second thing is through rebaptism. If that's something that, um, let's say you've, you've wandered away and you think, consider yourself a prodigal and you want to come back to the church, then rebaptism is, is another option. And then the third one is through profession of faith. If you've been baptized by immersion before, but you were part of a different denomination or congregation, and now you want to, to join us, um, that's going to be the, the third option um, to join our church. So normally, we have a baptism here, but today we're going to have a profession of faith. I don't know how many of you guys know Terry and Rhonda. I did tell them I would embarrass them for a little bit. So um, I'm going to ask you guys if you can just stand right here in the front, okay? The Mevo should be able to capture your faces. So people online, your online church family will be able to catch you as well. And I see Denise there with Instagram. So if there's anyone on Instagram, you'll be able to see Tara and uh, Terry and Rhonda Boffman. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, some of you guys have seen them. They're not necessarily new faces here in the church. I believe they arrived the same time or almost the same time when I arrived here in Corrales. So we're about the same uh, length of time being here. And they have decided to make Corrales Seventh-day Adventist Church their church, their home church. And I will say um, they have a powerful and awesome testimony, and maybe one day, you know, we'll have them um, share it with you. But we didn't go out looking for them. They were the ones who found us. And when I hear stories like that, I'm really, it makes me really happy. And they, you know, they, they were already in love with Jesus, but they continued studying their word, and they um, met Molly and Jerry, and then they even joined a small group that meets on Thursdays. If you guys are part of that small group, just raise your hand, okay? All right. You guys are actually big. You're not that small of a group. But one thing I do know is that you guys like to throw down when it comes to food, all right? Um, so that was really awesome to see that you guys, you know, were actively um, studying and, and meeting um, every Thursday with the group here in the church. So today what we're doing is we're making it official, okay? So I will take a vote from a congregation. Is there a motion that we accept Terry and Rhonda Boffman into the Corrales Seventh-day Adventist Church? Okay, lots of um, people moved it. Do I have a second? Okay, all those who are in favor, say aye. aye. Now say welcome. welcome. Okay, it's carried. So Matthew will record that. It's gonna be made official in the Corrales um, church books. And before we send you guys off, we do have something for you. This is a profession of faith um, certificate. I'll just read Rhonda's, okay, because hers is on top. Rhonda Faye Boffman was accepted by profession of faith and received into the Corrales Seventh-day Adventist Church of the Texaco Conference on the 24th day of April, the year of our Lord, 2021, signed by your pastor, Mike Razon. So this is for Rhonda. There you go. And this one's for you, Terry. Okay. And then we also have, let's go with, in order. Thank you guys for helping out with this. We have flowers for, for you guys. So you will always remember this. Um, if anybody wants to take pictures, this is the time also. And then we have a couple of books for you guys. This one's a devotional, um, Believe in His Prophets by Herbert E. Douglas. And I'm just going to give it to you, but I know that you guys share things. So, um, And then this one is Secrets Revealed, the Prophecies of Daniel and Revelation Made Simple. 
students. Um, you guys are students of scripture and the word. And then the last one, of course, is we have a card for you guys from the church as a token of our welcome to you all. All right, so this is Terry and Rhonda Boffman. Thank you, thank you. I'll leave that, that table up there. Um, I'm used to moving around from time to time. Um, just another quick note, and then we'll really go into the word, is uh, some of you guys heard there's been some updates in the, the health order. Um, for now, we're going to leave things as is, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to meet uh, sometime this week your leadership, and we're going to be talking about what we're going to do um, in terms of the future church services. So we do want you guys to just keep an eye out for that, either on social media or if you're signed up for one call now, I will send out a mass announcement once we've made a decision how we're going to proceed um, from here on out. So if you're not signed up for our one call now, um, maybe send an email to the Corrales uh, Church email, corraleschurch at gmail.com, or is it Corrales SDA Church? Corraleschurch at gmail.com. We'll manually put you in. If you're already signed up for one call now and you're getting the newsletter, um, then we'll update you that way as well. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. No quiz today. I hope that's okay with you. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are so excited to be in church today. Um, this is our time with you. So whatever has happened during the week, we just laid that aside, whether um, it's something that's been bothering us or we've been hurting we're just coming to you now, Lord, because you are a God who heals. You are a God who restores. You're also a God who gives rest. And so, Lord, may we find rest in you today when we cast our burdens down. And, Lord, there's um, rejoicing here in our church, for we have um, um, Terry and Rhonda joining us. We know in heaven there's, there's a party going on. Um, and one day, Lord, when we're able to have potluck, we're really going to, to celebrate and, Lord, we also know that there's people who are not here today um, for whatever reason. They are still part of our church family, and we lift them up to you in prayer. Dear God, um, as we open up your word, speak to us, inspire us, change us. So when we leave this place, we're not the same people that went in, but we will be out ready to do your will and a reflection of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are going to be talking about temptations. Temptations. Not the group, but temptations. <laughs> when you hear the word temptation, what comes to your mind? Ponder about this. This is not a rhetorical question. I want you to think about it as I tell you a story. There once was a scorpion who needed to cross the pond. But he couldn't do it on his own. He was a scorpion. So this scorpion goes up to this frog. Um, as the story goes, I'm assuming they're friends or they're at least acquaintances. And he says, hey, I need your help. I need to get across the pond. And this frog says, well, you know what? You're a scorpion. You sting. You sting people. You sting other animals. That's what you do. And if you sting me, guess what? I'm going to die. And the scorpion says, no, I won't sting you. Don't worry. Because if I sting you and you die and you drown, guess what? If I'm on you, I'm going to drown too. So he says, don't worry about it. So what do you think this frog does? Maybe you guys know this story. He goes ahead, lets the scorpion, gets on his back. They start making their way across the pond to the other side. Must have been a big pond. And about halfway through, the frog feels this sharp pain. Oh, he gets stung by the scorpion. And as the venom is, is seeping into him, he can feel his body weakening. He tells the, the scorpion, why did you sting me? Now we're both going to die. And you know what the final words were from the scorpion? It's my nature. And they both died. Now that's a sad story, isn't it? Why am I telling you this? This is not a, a, a children's story. The thing is, a lot of us have things in our nature. And a lot of us have certain inclinations that 
Sometimes it's like we, we, we mess up and we tell somebody, I couldn't help it. And this is what we call temptations, okay? Temptations. What are some things that uh, you Corrales Seventh-day Adventist Church people are tempted with? Just say it out loud, one thing. What is something that tempts you? I'm going to count to three, and you're going to say it even if you have your mask on. One, two, three. Okay. I, I didn't even hear anything. I just heard... <laughs> I just heard sound. So I guess it, it is a little tough with the mask, okay? But there's a lot of things that we struggle with. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian or a believer. There are things that we all struggle with. So let's start with a working definition of what a temptation is. Because some people, I think, are confused what a temptation, what a temptation is. Is temptation a sin? Yes or no? Okay, very good. It is not a sin, okay? What you do after you've been tempted could be a sin, or it may not be. It just depends on what you do. So um, a working definition we're going to go with today is temptation is a strong desire or a strong urge to do it. Usually it's bad, but it's not always bad. So if you're having this strong desire um, because you, you see this big cake and you just want to eat it. That's a temptation. Okay? Some people will say, well, that's bad. Some people will say, well, that's good. Is it good or bad to eat cake? I don't know. So let's do a poll here. Raise your hand if you think you succumb or you fall into temptation. Like, think of a typical day for you and all the temptations that come your way, all the urges. Would you say that you fall into temptation or you are defeated 50% of the time? How many of you would say that? Okay. How, how many of you would say, no, you know what? I overcome it. So I'm able to overcome temptation 50% of the time. It's the opposite of what I just said earlier. Okay. Some of you are not sure. And maybe I'm confusing you with a question. What I'm trying to find out is... If when temptation comes to you, are you more likely to overcome it or are you more likely to succumb to it? That's what I'm trying to get at. So is temptation something that you struggle with or is temptation something that you see it and you're like, ah, and then you move on? Well, it depends on the temptation. All right, one of the biggest temptations that we have is food. And if you know creation story or the fall story, what was the first temptation? It involved food, all right? But there's more to it than that. So in your Bibles, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. In your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2. Today, I, this week was a little tough. I was not able to type up the, the verses, so you guys will have to actually look it up. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and we will pick up, I think it says verse 16 there, but let's go to verse 15 for context. This is right after the creation story, or as creation story is wrapping up. Genesis chapter 2, let's start in verse 15. I'm reading from New King James Version. Are we all there? All right, amen. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not what? You shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall, what does the Bible say? You will surely die. Is God a liar? No. So if they were to eat it, if man were to eat what God said don't eat, what was the result? And did Adam and Eve die? Now some people say, well, when they ate, they didn't drop dead. But guess what? The process of decay, the process of death had already started. So God tells them, don't eat of it. And then we go to Genesis chapter 3, and let's find out what happens. 
Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see how he's using trickery and deception? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst or the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil evil. Now let's slow down here. Let's go to verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and what? And she ate. So was looking at the tree the sin? Was having a conversation with the devil a sin? What was the sin? The result of what she did after. The Bible says that she ate. So what took place before that? That's what we call a temptation. And from then on, that DNA of disobeying God, that DNA of sin has now been passed down from Eve to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation, until we come down to us. And this is very important, because up until that point, God made what we call free moral agents. Do you guys know what a free moral agent is? Is a dog a free moral agent? Is a cat a free moral agent? And I'll explain that in a moment. Are babies, are they free moral agents? Okay, so a free moral agent is basically someone who can make moral decisions and be held accountable for their actions. And when we read in Genesis that God gave Adam and Eve a choice, guess what? You are a free moral agent. And as human beings, we are free moral agents. That means we can choose right from wrong. We have the ability to choose. And guess what? When we make that decision we are held accountable for the consequences. So a dog cannot make moral decisions, right? Sometimes we can train them and they can go by their instinct, but they are not the same level as us. Our babies free moral agents. They are not. And this is why we don't baptize babies because they are not able to make the right and wrong decision at this point. All they know is I want milk, right? I want milk or I want my diaper changed, I don't like this feeling. And that's it, but as from baby, you guys move on to toddler, from toddler, you know, you move on to preschool, and you get older and older, then you start realizing some things. And then you're realizing um, moral stuff, and then you're able to make decisions that come your way. So this is why it's very important that after Adam and Eve sinned, we realize that that DNA is now getting passed from generation to generation to generation. This is like when you go to a hospital or to the doctor's office, they ask you, what is your medical history, right? Uh, is, does breast cancer run in the family? Heart disease. Why is it important for them to know that? Because there's a good chance that this is in your genes and you will be susceptible to this as well. So guess what else we are susceptible to? Sin. So maybe next time your doctor asks you for your medical history, you should put sin also because that has gotten passed down from generation to generation. But what it boils down to is when temptations come our way, we have the ability to choose. What do we have the ability to do? We have the ability to choose. Every day, we have choices. Should I harbor jealousy? Should I be content? Should I cheat on my wife? Should I be faithful to my wife? Should I download illegal music? Or should I go to Best Buy and buy it? Is God really the only God in my life? Or do I value my boyfriend more? Is God really the only God in my life, or do I value my career more? 
Is God the only God in my life, or do I value Amazon more? That's what it means when God says, don't have other gods before me. What other gods do we have in our life? So with temptation, it's always coming our way, but the good news, but the bad news, slash good news, is that we always have the ability to choose. And we see this throughout the Bible. This is why um, Joshua is telling the people right before, you know, he knows his, his time is up, he's an old man, and he asked the children of Israel, choose for yourselves this day. And then he closes with these words, as for me and my house, what was his decision? We will serve the Lord. So every day we are faced with a decision. What are we going to do when temptation comes our way? But my good news, brothers and sisters, is there are some things that we can do to help us fight temptation. I don't know if you remember, a while back we started the series of War in the Mind. We are part of this thing called the Great Controversy, and it's not always a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle, and it's a battle that takes place where? It's a battle that takes place in our minds. So there are some things that we can do to help us combat temptation. So one of the things I'm going to tell you guys, first of all, is the concept of chunking. How many of you have ever heard of chunking? Not chucking, but chunking. Okay? Um, those of you who maybe are therapists or psychologists, maybe you've heard of this. But chunking is basically the idea of autopilot. So, for example, I will pick on Ellie and I because I see him in the first row. Every morning he gets up around the same time for school. Every morning he has the same routine, right? He'll go to the pantry, uh, get a box of cereal. He'll go to his kitchen, get a bowl of cereal, pour that. He's going to get milk, pour that get a spoon, and he's able to do that. He could probably do that with his eyes closed. Why? Because it's the same routine that he does day after day after day. And his body is going to, or his mind is going to start taking some of these routines and putting them together so that he's on autopilot. Those of you guys who go to work or school to the same place every day, have you ever had an instance where you got in the car and then the next instant you were at work? And you're like, how did I get here? What traffic lights did I pass? You know what that's called? It's called chunking because your body has been put on autopilot. And before you know it, you're doing these things without even thinking about it. So how does this work with temptation? So here's the thing. How you react to certain temptations, and if you keep reacting the same way, guess what? Your body starts getting used to it, and your body starts getting numb to it, and your body starts going into auto pilot so that it gets to the point where if there is a trigger, you're not even thinking about it, and that's how you react. Is that good or is that bad? It's both, okay? It's bad if your reaction is a negative reaction to it, or if you know there's something that you shouldn't be doing and you continue doing it. This is why some Seventh-day Adventists, when they go to the other side, they go all out. I will just use an example. Um, let's say drinking is something you've struggled with, okay? And you drink one or two uh, instances. It's not a big deal. But what if you keep doing it and doing it and doing it? Pretty soon your body develops this routine. You're chunking and it becomes part of it so that now when the Holy Spirit is knocking, you're tuning him out more and more and more and more until pretty soon you hardly hear him anymore. But guess what? The good news is that the opposite is also true. If we develop good habits or some things that we've struggled with, let's say you want to start eating healthy and you take little steps and your body gets used to eating carrots because you never liked carrots before. And then pretty soon, you start eating salads. And then pretty soon, you're putting carrots on your pizza and, and dessert, right? And your body starts wanting more and more of that. That's also called chunking as well. Let me tell you guys um, something that, that, that will help us here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. When you get there, say amen. If you need more time, say mercy. Okay, I'll wait for you. Matthew chapter 12. 
We're going to go to verse 43. Matthew 12, verse 43. All right, here we go. Matthew 12, verse 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Now, you might think this is a good thing, right? So let, let, let's uh, make this spiritual. There is a man, he has a lot of mess in his life. And just like that demoniac who has that encounter with Jesus, he's like, who are you? We're legion. And Jesus casts those demons out, right? And they go into the pigs. So we would take this into the spiritual realm. There's a lot of demons in your life. And you have an encounter with Jesus. And he helps you. And you think, well, just because I'm, I'm baptized now, I'm not going to have those same temptations anymore. But the problem is, yes, Jesus cleaned house. But you didn't do anything with that clean house. And you left it empty and void. You didn't fill it with something constructive. You didn't fill it with people who are going to be better influences in your life. What happens? Those same demons come back, those same temptations. And what happens? Let's pick up in verse 45, Matthew 12, 45. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. So it shall also be with this wicked generation. So this might sound morbid, and this might sound like a negative thing, but here's the thing. Jesus is there for us. He can help us overcome temptation, but the problem is a lot of times we make it a one-time thing. And yes, Jesus helps us, but then we don't do anything else about it. And when that temptation comes again, and if we haven't filled our life with something else, then guess what? We might be in a worse situation than we were in before. This is like veggie meat, right? I know a lot of you here like veggie meat, but it's like making that transition. It's like, I know I don't want to eat meat anymore. So what do you do? You go buy the Morning Star stuff, right? Uh, the ones in the can. What are they called? Fry chick. I love fry chick. I love just opening a can and just eating it right out of the can. Now, those of you who are longtime SDAs, you know what I'm talking about. If you're newer, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. But here's the thing. Here's the purpose of veggie meat. Veggie meat is not supposed to take place of real meat, but it's meat substitute. Yes, but you should use it as a transition. And your ultimate goal, if you're trying to become vegetarian, is not to eat meat, eat tofu, eat something else, right? So anyway, that's um, what happens when we fill our lives with something else. So the next time a temptation comes, we are able to overcome it. Let me ask you guys a question. Are there any teenagers here or young adults? Yeah, we have a few, OK? Not, not too much. All right, I see you, OK? Do you think that teenagers today have it harder than the teenagers of 20 or 30 years ago. I see some people nodding their heads. I don't know if I fully agree with you, OK? And I'm not a teenager. But I do think that a lot of the same struggles and temptations are the same. Peer pressure. Right? It doesn't matter what generation you're in, you will experience that. The pressure to um, premarital sex, the pressure to, to do drugs. And you could be a teen 20 years ago or a teen right now, but the struggle is still the same. And I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. I think the biggest difference is access. The same stuff that we struggled with 20 years ago is still the same stuff that teens struggle with today, but the difference is things are more accessible now. Let's take pornography, for example. Uh, you know, I believe before then, you probably had to buy a magazine. 
Then it became DVDs. Now you don't even have to go to the store, right? It's literally available in um, electronics. And even in television today, the stuff that is being shown now is basically similar. It wasn't stuff that we would be seeing 20 years ago. So maybe the struggle is still the same, but the access is different. And why is that? Here we go. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. How many of you have read the book of Revelation recently? Excellent. Revelation chapter 12. Do you know what's going on in Revelation chapter 12? There is a war in heaven, right? One of my favorite verses, because it also has my name. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. You dare say amen. All right, Revelation 12, 7. It says, and war broke out where? In heaven. So this is both a physical, but it's also a spiritual war. It says, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Do you guys know who the dragon is? Who is the dragon? Let's find out. Verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. That, what, what's that word? Serpent of old. So guess what? The same serpent that's here is the same serpent in Genesis. Yes or yes? Yes, it is. And what did that serpent do? He deceived. There was a temptation. And he made Adam and Eve succumb to temptation. Or he didn't make them. But they succumbed to temptation because of, of what he tempted them with. And it says, he's also called the devil and Satan. If there's no doubt, or if you had doubt, now there's no doubt. Who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast with him. That's pretty scary. Verse 12. We're going to skip the next couple of verses. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe, to the inhabitants of where? Of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has what? A short time. That's scary. He's not in heaven anymore. He's on earth. And we know that. That's Adam and Eve, right? Garden of Eden. But he knows that he has a short time. Do you guys believe that Jesus is coming soon? How soon? Because I, I say this in almost every sermon, and yes, I hear amens. But here's the thing. Are we thinking soon, like, after I retire, which would be, like, in 30 years? Are we thinking soon when our kids go off to college? Are we thinking soon as in the next two, three years? How soon? And if you think it's very soon, then guess what? You're not the only one who knows that. The devil knows that too. And so wouldn't you think that he would ramp up his efforts to tempt us, to bring down our teenagers, and then even you teenagers, the teenagers that will come after you? Because he knows that time is short and he doesn't have much time. So he's going to get even more creative in the temptations. Because if one thing doesn't work one way, do you think the temptation will stop? It's just going to take a different form. Maybe instead of your friends pressuring you, maybe it's a TV commercial. If it's not a TV commercial, maybe it's your own husband or wife. But the devil is going to use anything that he can to tempt us and bring us down. But I don't want to leave you guys without any hope. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this will be our last verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Who wrote Corinthians? Paul. Do you think Paul was tempted? Do you think Paul had his struggles? Do you think Paul was able to overcome some of his struggles? Hmm. I believe that whatever was avail available for the disciples is still available to us today. 
whatever was available to Jesus when he was tempted, still available for us today. 1 Corinthians, what chapter? Chapter 10. What verse? Let's start in verse 11 so we can get some background. Verse 11. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen to them as examples. He's talking about stuff in the Old Testament. He says that they were written for our admonition or warning or lesson, whatever word uh, makes sense, upon whom the end of the ages have come. What are you telling us, Paul? Verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Stop being so cocky. That's what he's saying. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is what? Faithful. And when you see that word is, you can even interchange it like an equal sign. Faithful is God who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So there's two promises here that Paul is leaving us. Number one, he's saying that God is faithful. Guess what? What I'm about to tell you is true. Just as true as God is faithful, that God will not let you be tempted more than what you can handle. And I hear a lot of people using this sometimes out of context. Like maybe there, there's um, a trial in your life, and you're saying, well, God can only give me what I can handle. That's true. But in this context, he's talking about temptations. So if you're ever temp tempted to cuss your boss out, think of this verse. If you're ever tempted to disrespect your parents, think of this verse. If you are ever tempted to break one of the commandments, think of this verse. If you're ever tempted to look at your neighbor's yard, because there's that phrase, the grass is greener on the other side, Think of this verse. If you ever tempted to look at someone else other than your spouse, think of this verse. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Man, that's awesome. Because when I'm struggling with something, guess what? God knows. You know what? Yes, it's hard, but I know you can do it. And then the last promise, and we'll close with this. He says, with the temptation, will also make the way of escape. What a promise. What a promise. That you may be able to bear it. What are you tempted to do? I'll even take it a step further. What have you fallen for? Whatever it is, it's not too late. You could be in the middle of taking a substance that you know you're not supposed to because it's separating you from God, and you could already be sticking that needle in, but God says, I will still make a way of escape. You may be with someone who is not somebody that you are married to, and the, it's, things are heating up, God says, I will make a way of escape. You are at work, and you're getting ready to blast your boss because they, I don't know, were talking about you or gossiping about you, and you're getting ready to do something that's non-Christian to them. Paul promises that God will make a way of escape. Let's claim this promise. Whatever you are tempted with, and maybe you're not tempted with anything right now. But in the future, remember, God will not give you more than what you can handle. But equally awesome is the promise that if you are in the midst of temptation, call on him. Come to the throne of grace and mercy. And he will give you what you need in your time of need. This is the promise to us. And I hope this week, as we get ready to start a new week, that we will remember his words. That when we are tempted, he will give us a way of escape.
and he will not allow us to be tempted more than what we can handle. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your promises. I appreciate the words of the Apostle Paul, knowing, Lord, that whatever is going to come our way, it's already been filtered by you, so we don't have to worry. What you ask us, it's to be faithful. But sometimes, Lord, being faithful can be difficult. Sometimes, Lord, it's not in our DNA. So I ask that when we are in the midst of our struggles, when we are in the midst of our temptations, that you will help us not to go at it alone. That we will call on you, on you and we will remember your promise. So Lord, if anyone here is in the valley of struggle or indecision, I just ask, Lord, that you may come close to them at this moment. And Lord, for those who feel that maybe they are stronger and they have a closer walk with you, I pray, Lord, that they will not stumble, that we will stay faithful to you to the end, for we know that you are coming soon. And just because the devil's going to ramp up his efforts to discourage, to deceive, to tempt, doesn't mean we need to be afraid. If anything, Lord, strengthen us as we stay faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all, and we're going to dismiss as we usually dismiss, and we'll see you next Sabbath.